Canadian border, made it 200 miles to Old Town, Maine, and showed up in the 1870 census as bateau builders. I don't know how that happened, but they were reasonably successful ones. I was impressed to discover that, uh, as shown here, the, the census indicated that uh, Otis felt that he had $1,000 in personal estate at that point, which adjusting for inflation is about $23,000 today, which for 20-something, getting started in a new business is, is pretty impressive. His, uh, and by 1874, as shown in the main register of business directory, he and William Wallace were big enough and successful enough to be listed as Patel Builders in Old Town. And then, the other thing that I failed miserably on is that I wanted to find a picture of Guy, and I could not. This is actually Otis, his brother, so you have an idea of what he looked like. I could find his gravestone, I could find his house, but I couldn't find any pictures of Guy. Um, it turns out that Guy had a daughter who did not have any children, and so I suspect at some point there was a whole collection of Carlton information that went to the dump. And Otis had lots of children and lots of grandchildren, and his granddaughter kindly shared this image with me, so I at least had something to, uh, to show you. But, and then by 1880, Otis was off seeking his fortune in the West, and Guy was, the, uh, was all alone as a Beto maker. It's interesting that uh, Otis was the Beto builder in 1870, and Guy was works in the bateau shop, whereas he was the, uh, the bateau maker by 1880. And for a little uh, tangent here, for those of you who are not familiar with what a bateau is, this is the basic workboat of the North Maine woods. And so if you need, if you think of it sort of like a pickup truck today, if you need to move a bunch of people or a bunch of equipment anywhere, this was how it got done. And particularly during the log drives, that was a, was a big deal. You could paddle it, you could row it, you could pole it. And they, of course, with the hobnail boots that were the standards for the, uh, for the river crews at that point, they took a lot of abuse and didn't tend to last very long. So it was a, a reasonably uh, lucrative business, I suspect, for, uh, for Guy Carlton. And in fact, his bateaus were so popular that when Commander Perry was looking for a boat to help him get to the North Pole, he just he bought three of them from the Carlton. They were specially armored, steel armored and runner, as they mentioned in this case, and built to the with special lumber to the specifications and dimensions that, uh, that Perry required. But that's getting ahead of the story here. Let me dolly back and get back on the timeline which is when 1883 is when Guy Carlton and William Wallace were both listed in the New England Business Directory as canoe builders. Now this is significant because they're the second canoe builders after Evan Garish, who was first listed in 1881. So they were, he was a pioneer. He was right up there in the, the very early days. And of course, it's a very logical extension if you're in the bateau business. And 1883 is also when he bought the uh, the sawmill on Steam Mill Point, shown in the background in this picture, and the buildings in the foreground are his canoe business. And so he was really running a, a couple of different businesses. And he was chasing it pretty hard. In the 1890s, he was advertising himself as builders of canvas canoes, bateau, etc. He was, he was going after the, uh, the canoe business and of course the lumber business. He was also a dealer in all kinds of canoe building material, horse paddles, etc. So he was going along, and at this time, there had been an Indian agency store in Old Town for many years, selling crafts from the Penobscots, bark canoes, baskets, bead goods, you know, a variety of things. And in the very late 1890s, there were some transitions going on in that business. And suddenly, in 1899, Carlton is now being listed as a supplier of birch bark canoes. And I'm not sure if he actually was building them or if he was just reselling ones from the island. But this continued through the early 1900s. And so in looking around for who might have been the source of this, I have come across Louis P. Sock, who, according to the birch bark people, was 
a builder of bark canoes in a factory style, in a factory setting. And there are a few of these around. The Canadian Canoe Museum has one. He did label some individually. And I even found a picture of him. Although this identified him as Louis Pisac, as all one word, but this is an idea of what his, he and his canoes might have looked like. And things were going along fine until late in 1901, Guy took ill. He had a heart problem. And in January of 1902, he died. And as described here, Old Town lost one of her most highly respected citizens. The most highly respected, as the case may be. And the business did not stop, though. Mr. Tibbetts had been running the firm, and in May of 1902, Mr. Weeks purchased a half interest, and things continued. And they weren't struggling along. This <coughs> advertisement for 1904 shows that they were going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Old Town, White, Morris. They were, they were out to, uh, to compete. And by 1905, they were even publishing catalogs. The canoes shown in this catalog are not guide canoes, are not only guide canoes. They made some very fancy mahogany canoes, long decks, and so it's occurred to me that it's entirely possible that some of these UFOs that we, these Charles River boats with all their nice long mahogany decks and all, may in fact be Carlton's. Uh, that this was, they were going after the urban market. They were not simply restricting themselves to the local market. And then by 1908, the internal combustion engine, inboard engines, small enough to fit in canoes, were becoming very popular, and Carlton went after it with a vengeance. They, they featured it on the cover of their catalog, and as shown inside, this was a pretty fancy boat. Of course, it had an engine, it had invisible sponsons, it had a rudder and uh, weed protection around the rudder. It was probably quite a crowd. So, and to identify canoes from this era, you're typically going to find either a small brass tag held on with two nails, as shown in the upper part of this, or a very fancy decal, as shown in the, uh, in the lower image. <coughs> and then in March of 1910, Carlton was sold to Sam Gray, the Old Town Canoe Company. And so it was quite a surprise, quite a change. The, and Sam bought the whole thing. He bought the sawmill, he bought the retail stores, and this is another shot showing the sawmill down by the river. And it was actually the sawmill that was the biggest appeal. When Sam wrote in the secretary's notes to the Old Town Canoe Company, he said that he was, this was finally gave him the chance to secure a source of supply of white cedar for ribs, and of course hardwoods for the trim inside them. And so that was a really big deal. It was a classic vertical integration, as they call it today. And the fact that he had a established brand name that uh, they could go along with it was an added bonus. And they didn't waste any time. They started right in as the sale occurred in March. And by April, they were already starting to record canoes. Carlton had their own numbering system. They were at about 7,000. And by early April, they were actually shipping canoes to Troy, New York. And uh, they were off and running. Now, the state of Maine had an annual Bureau of Industrial Labor Relations Statistics group that would go and look at different businesses around the state. And this provides an opportunity to get some perspective on, uh, on how big Carlton was and how it compared to some of the others. And you can see here at the top of the list, they had about 20 employees in 1910. Old Town had about 50. White Canoe Company had, had nine. Morris had 30. And they were very liberal-minded. They had one woman as well. I suspect that was, uh, that was probably Bert's wife in, in the office, but nonetheless. Uh, Kennebec Canoe Company had about 20. And then there were a handful in the Kennebecport area in a variety of different builders. And they were, of course, building more than just canoes. And at this time, the, they went to the larger plate they had a, a straight line, sort of Carlton canoe look to it, and these typically have serial number records that you can find so you get more information about them. And then about a year later, disaster struck. The Carlton mill burned flat. 
Total loss was insured, estimated at about $8,000 at that time, and they did start rebuilding almost immediately. The, uh, the key element of this, though, is that from this point on, all building of property news was consolidated into the same factory with Old Town. And so that's when things started to look, uh, look familiar. That's also around the time that you start to see the more traditional curved Carlton name tags as shown here on the bottom. And the one here on the top is one that was used later in the 30s and 40s. There are some examples of them here if you uh, on, the, on the table in front if you want to look at them. But they were up and running. And they continued to print Carlton catalogs, continued to market them, because this allowed Old Town essentially to double their dealer network. They, if Macy's was selling Old Town canoes, and right around the corner was Abercrombie and Fitch or Gimbals, and they were selling Carlton canoes, well, technically they weren't competing with each other, even though they were, came out of the same factory. And so Carlton canoes are often identified by the, heart, the traditional heart-shaped deck. They also have a curved carry handle in the front, Again, hearkening back to the bark canoe style. And this one in particular, you know, you, people with uh, sharp eyes will notice it has diamond head bolts. So it was mid 20s canoe that, uh, that are found on both Carlton's and Old Town from that era. And longtime assembly goers will, uh, will probably recognize this catalog cover that uh, this was used a few years ago. And they did that in a number of different color schemes over the years. And in 1924, they came out with their own collection of color designs. They named them, designated them as design A, B, and E for some reason. I'm not sure what happened to C and D. But, uh, but these were distinguished from the old town designs that were numbered. And so if somebody ever wants a really fancy paint job, I'd love to see this chain link one in, in the flash sometime. But I suspect, of course it was, this was a $14 color design at a time when a canoe was in the $50 to $100 range, so you can get an idea of the amount of time that goes into that. And of course, in that era, you're, you really weren't fully outfitted unless you had a good parasol and pillows for your canoe to, to keep it going. And Carlton made some very, continued to make some very fancy canoes. Last night, Michael talked about one Molitor style that was done. This one is actually out of the green. This is a picture of the one out there. It's, uh, it's a Indian princess grade Molitor with a Carlton number as the, uh, the lower serial number. And they put all the fancy trimmings into these things. And here's another picture of a Carlton on the green. This was not this year. And you can probably recognize that's not a traditional heart-shaped deck for, uh, for a column. That's a traditional Old Town bogey style deck with a column plate. And of course, since they were all being built in the same factory, it was not unusual if they had a large column of order and they needed a canoe in a hurry, say a red 17 foot, and if they didn't have a column, they would either change the Old Town, you know, remove the deck, change the serial numbers, make it look like a column, or in some cases, they just slap a tag on it and ship it out the door. And so this particular canoe has a Carlton tag on the stern and an old town decal on the bow. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this didn't just happen on full-size canoes. Uh, the canoe on your left here was a four-foot sign canoe, as it's shown on the build tag here, that was built in December of 1925. And it was given an old town number, 89,161. Uh, but you'll notice on the very last line, it was to be lettered with the Carlton Canoe Company. So they actually changed the decks, put in about port, <coughs> carry port for it, and shipped it off to Hudson in Detroit. And on the very top section here, you can see that there are also some shipping records that are available for Carlton. And so this particular one was, as you can see, shipped to Hudson, February 16, four-foot display canoe with a serial number. It's also interesting that it was noted that it was a consignment, and it had a $25 value, which was about one-third the price of a full-size canoe at that time. And then on the back side of the card, you can see where it was shipped back in, uh, at the end of the year, 
and then in turn shipped off in May of 1927 to Gimbel's in New York City. And I found it a few years ago at an auction in North Carolina, and I have no idea what the story between being, how I got from New York City to, uh, to North Carolina, but it seemed like a fun one to have. And as I mentioned, there are also a number of Crompton records that have survived, and they're stacked here on the, uh, on the table. And if there happens to be a, someone who is knowledgeable about how accounting was done in the 20s, I'd love to talk to them and go through, because some of these are clearly shipping records and logs, some of these are expense records, and some might be a customer list, but I'm really not sure what they mean. And so if somebody wants to go through them with me, I'd love to, uh, to be able to understand more. But these showed up in an uh, auction for an abandoned storage facility in Bangor. And I was able to buy, uh, buy most of them, but there are still some big gaps in them. But it does mean that for Carlton, we do have an addi additional level of information that's available for many of the computers. And then, of course, we get up to the, the 30s, Great Depression. It was, a, frankly, a pretty tough time being in the business. Carlton soldiered on, as did most of the rest. And then in 1941, they issued their last catalog. It was actually a 1940 catalog with a little white sticker over the, uh, over the date to tell you the price has gone up. And, but things were in pretty steep decline. And then 1943, the end, the end of the line had come. The last two Carlton's were shipped out the door. The last one was serial number 20540. And it was a nice fancy double A grade Indian princess with lots of mahogany, 30 inch decks. You know, nice, nice boat. I'd love to find it someday. <laughs> but that, knowing that serial number, provided a way to answer a question that had long been asked of me, and I never really had a good answer for, which is, how many wooden canoes are out there? And furthermore, how many are left? And so, by looking at Carlton, that we knew the highest serial number, and Kennebec, and Morris, and Old Town. In this case, Old Town, this is an estimate of how many of their canoes, they mix boats and canoes in, so it's a little lower. But, we had uh, you know, a rough number that we could come up with, a little over 300,000 wooden canoes that we could presumably identify as having been built. And I've been answering built record requests for a while, and a number of other people have, Kathy Close or Morris, things like that, Daniel for Rushton. And so by asking them, I said, well, how many have you answered? And how long have you been answering them? And so if you look, for example, I've been answering Carlton records since 1997. Old Town Records the year before that, and these are the number of ones that I found. And that's clearly not all the canoes that are out there, but it should give us an order of magnitude. And the bottom line is that it looks like there's about a two to three percent survival rate on wooden canoes. So out of those 300,000, there ought to be about 9,000 of those known builders that we can account for. So that's that's kind of giving some information, but that's really only half the picture because we don't know all the Peterborough, Chestnut, Charles River builders, Thompson, you know, there were a slew of other builders. So we didn't have a real good handle on, on how to do that. So the last column is based upon a w database of WCHA canoes that was made in the 1990s. And at that time, they came up with about 1,700 canoes that were owned by members of the organization. And that's obviously not all of them, but if that is representative of the entire universe of canoes, then we have a way to estimate how many we don't know about. And in this case, the ones we know about represent about 45% of the canoes that are out there. And so if you make some estimates for the other 55%, we come up in the 700,000 range, the total number of wooden canoes that were made. And of those, We've probably got about 20,000 that are still out there wandering around. So as has been pointed out, for an organization that's of one to maybe 2,000 people, I don't think we're gonna run out. I think there's probably enough, you know, it looks like we've got about 10, 10 for every person. So we don't need to worry about that. We're still gonna fight over the nice bells, but at least we, we're, we're not gonna uh, run short anytime soon. And the story doesn't actually end there. 1972, 
Old Town came out with a new line of fiberglass canoes. And so to honor the tradition of Carlton and its role in the company, they decided to name these the Carltons. And that went on fine for about 10 years. And then uh, the interest in fiberglass started to wane. And there suddenly was more interest in Rogalex, or ABS canoes, as they were known. And so in 1982, they named an ABS canoe the Carlton. And that continued for a while, and then, of course, other canoes, other designs came along. And so now, only in organizations like this do you, uh, do you get to know or hear about Carlin. So, with that, I will open it up to questions. You can say, oh,